Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time, back with the one and only and amazing Anna Kelly. How you doing, Anna? I'm doing great. Always good to be here with you. Yeah. So someone that you and I, I wouldn't say follow, but you know, it kind of comes across our radar every now and again, uh, is in the media a lot today. And and he's he's he wears the moniker Dr. Doom. Yes. Which I believe back in the day he gave himself, um, back in the 2006 kind of uh, you know, crash. Uh, so again, he gave it to himself. His name's Noriel Rabini. Uh, yeah. He's out making a lot of noise talking about uh, some scary things and stagflation. And I thought we should break it down, discuss it, see what you and I agree, disagree with. Um, let's just say he is very consistent in his negativity. Let's say that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> he's an economist that accurately predicted the 2008, 2009 great recession. And so he was saying, this is going to be bad. Nobody's talking about this. Wake up, people, and got the moniker Dr. Doom. Um, I've been I've been watching him closely because I follow a lot of economists, and they're all over the place, right, depending on the data. They're looking, leading, or lagging indicators. Some think we're about to go into spiraling inflation. It's going to be difficult to tame, maybe into stagflation, which is kind of my take, where I kind of land. And others say inflation will be over so quickly, we're going into the deepest recession you've seen, and there's really more risk of deflation. And it depends on whether these economists are microeconomists or macroeconomists. And if they're looking at small um, short-term cycles or if they're looking at longer-term secular cycles as to where these predictions land. But most of us are just trying to figure out what's going to happen in the next couple of years. What do we have to do in the next couple of years to protect ourselves? And Noriel Rabini came out this week, and I wanted to share a quote uh, that I thought really sums up what's happening in a paragraph. He said, the world economy is lurching toward an unprecedented confluence of economic, financial, and debt crises following the explosion of deficits, borrowing, and leverage in recent decades. So he's basically saying, and I'll show, show one other thing he said, Globally, total private and public sector debt as a share of GDP, which which shows economic health, rose from 200% in 1999 to 350% in 2021. And in the U.S., it's now 420% debt to GDP, which is higher than during the Great Depression and after World War II. So he's essentially saying this explosion of unsustainable debt ratios is going to completely cause a financial crisis as bad as or not if were if if worse than 2008 because of insolvency debt across gl- the globe in both countries and corporations and also in households. So pretty scary stuff and I thought we should talk about it. Yeah, I think there's a lot in that. Um so the first thing I'd love to do with you first is kind of break down the macro micro economists because again that's that that's stuff I study that's my degree that's yeah. what I've been looking at for 30 years and this is how I actually break inflation down I'd love your opinion on this and it's really a combination of both sides and it frankly annoys me that economists don't step back and realize they're missing part of it so this is what I believe I actually believe inflation is built up of three blocks I think Lego blocks for lack of a better analogy. There is the top block, which the microeconomists and the Kathy Woods and the um, uh, Jeremy Siegels and all these other folks are, are keen on, and it's stuff. Right. I believe stuff, clothing, shipping, gas, stuff, physical things, will... Uh, roll off very quickly. I believe we're in the midst of that now, and I'll define quickly as by the end of Q1. Okay. Right? So I believe, you know, if we take the peak, which was 9-1, I believe we could be down to 6% headline inflation, CPI headline inflation, by the end of March, simply because stuff becomes cheaper and maybe even has deflation. Yeah, as- and I would call that discretionary stuff. I think you and I would agree. Right. Things yes. that we like, we want, but we don't really need. Need, and that will be number two. You're absolutely right. So this stuff inflation, a lot of people are focused on it, but they're extrapolating stuff to everything else. Here's the deal. 
stuff makes up about 32% of GDP, where services make up 68%. And you could see that in some of the numbers about PCE and labor right. and all these other things, right? Again, so that's that's that. So I think that's coming down. And if that's all you're focused on, of course, you're going to scream like Jeremy Siegel and say, we're going to have deflation and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, dude, clothing and TVs and computers is not our economy. It's 32% of our economy. Right. So right. that's easy. Then there's hard. And hard for me is housing. It's rent. It's owner's equivalent rent. Right. It it's you know, it's a lagging indicator. And like I did for easy, I'll define hard. It will take six to nine months to kind of trickle through. I think that takes us from six to four percent CPI headline. And then Anna, unfortunately, there's the really, really, really hard. There's the uh, and it's wages. I believe we're on the cusp of wage inflation. I think the numbers point to it already. I've been calling for it for six months. I believe we're in an era that will be five to 10 years in the making of structural deglobalization. We are going to make more stuff here and we pay more stuff. We pay people here more. We're, we're this, the era of globalization and CFOs running balance sheets is over. Right now it's, hey, I can't trust the stuff to show up. There's this, there's that. They don't like us. It's national security, whatever it is. I think we're going to have at least five years of, roughly speaking, 3.5 to 4% inflation because of wages. It rolls through services and some of stuff. So that's how I see inflation. That's my combined macro and microeconomic you yeah. know, understanding into one big thing. What do you think of all that? Yeah, I, I generally agree with you. You know, people talk about inflation like it's really homogenous, like it's going to be the same across all countries, the same across our country and everything. And and goods and services kind of break down, like you said, in things that we absolutely need, things that we want. And even within the things that we need, um, you've got you, you've got differences, right? You've got food, for example, you have energy, you have housing. Those are kind of the, the key three. And then we have transportation. Well, energy impacts transportation costs, right? So if gas goes up, if oil goes up, then the cost of transporting everything goes up. And so there's some, you know, stickiness and in inflation there. To your point about wages, you know, I, I agree with you. I think we were pushing very rapidly toward the Great Reset and globalization and the war with Russia and Ukraine um, and China's lockdowns and threats of China going after Taiwan, all those things create big, like, aha moments, right, where these countries are going, wait a second. No, 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 it, not going to happen. It gets stuff, and now it may be a matter of national security control, to control both our food, our fertilizer, and our Medicine. energy. Medicine. All of those things. Medicine's a huge one. My uh, Chips, right? There's four oh. new chip manufacturing companies coming to the DFW area, um, one of them's a chi a Taiwanese company. They're like, Taiwan we're not semi, yep. it over there, right? We're going to start making it here. And to your point, higher wages is something that's going to be there. Interestingly, the government actually is pushing for higher wages. At the same time, they're trying to fight inflation. They're trying to push for higher wages through certain programs like um, pay prevailing wages if you want certain government grants or loans for your multifamily yeah. development, right? Just yep. for example. So- um, I, I think to to that point, there's going to be an increase in the cost of the things that we need, including wages. And oh, by the way, with the great resignation, although a lot of people are going back to work, we have lower labor participation rates than I think we down ever. again yeah. ever. And so the fewer people work, the higher they are going to demand wages to do certain jobs. And even if unemployment goes up in certain sectors, many other sectors, there's going to be people that demand higher wages in order to take care of it. So I agree with you. And I think, you know, the challenge and what Rabini is basically saying is, you know, we have all these things that's not going to make it just easy to kill inflation. It's not going to happen overnight. And if if the Fed, because they can only control rates and monetary, you know, quantitative easing, easing or tightening. They yep. can't control um, all of the supply chain things and the deglobalization um, issues with fertilizer, food, energy, et cetera. So it's going to be a, a long, hard battle, most likely, 
to get inflation back down to two. Now, what I've said, and I think you're alluding to, and Rabini's also agreeing in what he's saying now, is we may never see inflation of 2% again. We certainly probably won't see it over the next decade. And so the Fed will likely have to keep interest rates high for a while, longer than what we think. And if they do that and debt service costs go up and stay up, then we will be both in kind of the stagflationary area where we've got inflation and slow growth and Mm -hmm. higher unemployment and recessionary conditions. And at the same time, we may have a debt crisis because we just have so much debt in the system that there's no way to service debt. And as a country, there's really very difficult way. It's very difficult for us to pay for it, right? Because governments don't want to cut taxes. Governments don't want to cut spending. And so they're basically relying on the central banks and monetary policy Mm -hmm. to try to fix things, avoid a crisis and and bring balance and stability back to the system. Yeah. You know, again, Norio Rubini has been kind of reiterating the same thing for, for 20 years. Uh, when we talk about debt, again, I, I, I always try to break things down into chunks because I think, again, just like inflation, you can't talk about debt like it's all equal. So what right. I've always looked at debt is there's three layers of the cake. There's national debt, there's company debt, and there's household debt. So let's talk about national debt for, and I'm not only talking, I like worldwide, like Japan's got debt, Russia's got debt, US, every right nationally. I think we are going to see some emerging economies. I mean, Sri Lanka, we saw some, you know, some activity, I think it was six months ago or so. We're going to see some emerging economies whose debt is dollarized, have, you know, what you call them, you know, write offs or insolvency or whatever. There's going to be some pain at national levels. Right. Uh, you probably most at emerging economies, there will be some give and take there. Um, it happened in the eighties. It happened in the nineties, right? It's, it'll happen again. So that's, I think the world knows how to deal with that. My opinion. But how do they deal with that? Michael central banks coordinate action to try to help out other countries, even out their currency imbalances, right. To minimize some of the dollarized debt impacting some of these countries. But they also, in lockstep, try to set interest rates kind of consistently. So I'll just make that point no, that it's true. sometimes we watch what's happening in the U.S. and we go, well, why does it matter what happens to Sri Lanka? Why does it right. matter you know, where the currency is or the interest rates are of the ECB, right, of the central banks? It's very important to realize that in every major financial crisis, global central banks and global governments try to coordinate to keep global international price stability, trade balances, and debt in balance. And so it is important to to recognize that we're not just talking about the U.S. here. Oh, for sure. Other countries could impact how our Fed reacts. It's not as simple as let's just get inflation down. No, I totally agree. And again, what will happen is there'll be some debt written off. Some debt will be extended and pretended. There'll be some trades of this and that. But this again, again, when you look at that layer, that layer by itself, we've been dealing with for my entire adult life. And right. we may have a few more of them, but I think generally speaking, the process is well understood. My sure. Opinion. Then there's the corporate level. And I agree, corporate debt. Frankly, companies did what they were supposed to do when, when debt was cheap. They laddered up. Uh, I believe there's a lot of, I, I think I read a percentage, something like 23% of the Russell 2000 or some scary number is are zombies. Yes. Uh, Carvana is in the news today, a threatening bankruptcy. Um, if you're a U.S. based entity, congratulations. That's what bankruptcy is all about. We are going to see a lot of debt written off. There's going to be a lot of people hurt. But the, the people that can't service it, like the cruise companies, they're extending. I mean, there's a lot of people that uh, there'll be some debt written off in bankruptcy court. There'll be lots of people taking haircuts. And some of that, I think, and some of that debt still fixed at crazy low rates, so they can service the debt. So I think part of the pain that Powell said is coming is in corporate. There will be bankruptcies. There will be company that take, there are people that take haircuts on principal debt. And there'll be people that have to get laid off because, hey, um, who was it? Discovery, uh, the the TV show or TV channel. Yes. It's like, we have to get back to free cash flow. 
that probably means I'm going to whack a lot of heads, right? right. Unemployment's going to go up, but they're going to get back to free cash flow so they can pay their debt. Right. So this is all part of the pain. Again, at the corporate level, at least the U.S. companies, that's what bankruptcy is for. They can discharge debt very in a structured manner. So sure. I think there's a it's lot the of employees and the investors that are hurt along the way. But yes, Absolutely. there's ways to wipe out the debt for sure. Now, now let's talk about the household. Household is a very interesting story because in totality, the amount of debt is higher than ever before. A lot of that is real estate debt. Heading into 2022, I don't have the data for 2022 yet, 98% of the debt was fixed. Doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It's fixed. Right. If I go into a world of 5% wage inflation and my most expensive other than taxes is my mortgage, is fixed. I'm loving life. This is this is net positive for me. I can service my debt even better. It's, yes, it's really as long, funny as, long as you don't have to move, you know, back to no, video number in. one, right? We talked about if you don't have to move, you don't have to worry if the value of your house goes down. But unfortunately, um, across the board, when these debt cycles happen, these big debt cycles, and they repeat sure. themselves, like we talked they about do. for different reasons, right? Uh, different factors that are kind of converging is that asset values start to fall. And so sure. corporate stock values fall, right? We're seeing that now home prices fall, commercial real estate falls, and it could fall even further. And mm -hmm. so as long as you are in an asset like your home that you can withstand over the long period of time, making that debt payment, you still have your job, you still have good wages, it's not going to impact you as badly. I'm more concerned about the people that have rising credit card debt. Sure. Almost 70% of the population lives check to check, and has uh, less than $4,000 saved, right? So when you combine those things, even though, yes, I can make my debt payment, if you lose one paycheck for some people, that may be enough to put you into personal bankruptcy. So you've got to be really, really careful. Um, and, and I think the point of all this, it's not to be doom and gloom like Dr. Gloom, right? But it's to say there's many different factors that influence what happens to the economy. The governments are going to react to lots of different things that are happening now, as well as potential, you know, new events that we don't see coming, right? God forbid new pandemics or a war or whatever. Mm -hmm. Corporations are going to be impacted by that. And then households are going to be impacted by both the corporate level and the government level. So I think we just have to be very, very careful. This is a period of time. We're back in the 80s. We have to say, where's all this convergence of issues that could impact the economy? And we need to expect that there's still going to be pain ahead over the next probably several years, right? So rather than say, okay, what do, what's the doom and gloom? And you know, we might as well shut it down. We say, what do we think could happen? How do we first protect ourselves? And when Amen. there's debt in the economy, the debt is the biggest risk to, the, to a financial crisis, right? Corporate, Agreed. national, personal, et cetera. So if you can personally deleverage yourself in things that is not fixed long-term debt, pay off those credit cards, yes, sell please. things that you think may come down in value, right? Uh, minimize and, and, and save money and then think about opportunity to go invest. You're going to do just fine, but there's going to be pain ahead, higher costs, right? Get lean. If you have a portfolio, cut, start cutting some of your expenses. Make sure you can service higher debt, maybe for a couple of years, if you have debt that's going to roll over in the next couple of years. So we watch these economists to say, okay, now what? Now what can we do? Hopefully, Dr. Doom is wrong. There's not a financial crisis. There's a mild recession. And in a few years, we're back to normal. But if not, you know what you do today and how you set yourself up to understand the big macro picture and say, there, there's going to be some pain. Now let's do what we can to work to live below our means de leverage our debt as much as possible and then work to find opportunity and expand our means and expand our income, you're going to do just fine. Yeah. Really what I take away or what I would tell the individual is, is really what you said on it is I, I always get nervous when people hear folks like Dr. Doom or Peter Schiff who are always negative and they look at this big, scary portrait that they paint, realizing that 
without realizing that most of that portrait will never touch them, the individual, right? There's right. just one little corner that may impact them, but most of this scary thing is, is just, it won't impact your daily life. So I think you gave right advice, which is take care of yourself, you and your family. If you got a bunch of credit card debt or variable rate debt or anything like that, we've been telling you winter is coming. Sorry, folks, winter is here. Yeah. Get that down. You know, not a time to, you know, I think it was um, uh, Jeff Bezos said, this is not the time to buy big things into it, like TVs. And I, I think right. he's right. I mean, like, right. uh, it's, it's time to see where we're going. I don't have a rosy picture for next year or the year after. I've said it could be the worst economic year at the macro level. Right. But at the micro level, because if you watch my channel, you know what we've been doing to get prepared. Got our debt fixed 30 years sub four. I'm good. I don't care what happens to prices. Right. Got a stack of dry powder. I'm already buying stuff out of the MLS. I'm closing my second deal today uh, for a 30% discount. So, I mean, I'm making moves already. Right. But, you know, it's because we, because we're prepared. So right. I'm excited for what's coming at the micro, but the macro is going to, it's going to be pretty bad. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, the, the, what happens in these big debt cycles as they flesh out, as debt is wiped out through bankruptcies and restructuring. Unfortunately, though, is that the wealth gap gets bigger and bigger. The poor are hit the hardest because the equity in their home sometimes is wiped out. May or may not happen. Go back and listen to episode one, right? But the other thing is people's retirements and 401ks are often wiped out when you have these yeah. big uh, fleshing out and resets. And so you need to think about your 401k, think about your IRA, where are you invested? And is this a time to think about taking some risk off the table, dollar cost averaging out on high days, just like you did in talk to your account, talk to your advisor. I'm not a financial advisor, but the best thing that I did when things, when I lost two thirds to three quarters of my 401k because of a looming financial crisis, was I took what little I had left and I put it as a down payment on assets. Best mm -hmm. thing I ever did, right? And so be really careful because the reason the wealth gaps continue to stretch is because most people lose their retirement funds and have to start all over. You don't want to be in that position. So look at these macro things to say, where can I de-risk some of my retirement and de-risk the debt on my home or anything else that I have, the credit card debt, because de-risking yourself and moving your wealth and your retirement stuff into things that are going to be resilient, hard assets, sometimes is going to be the best way to protect you. Those are the things that I did that allowed me to go from, you know, the bottom to to the top because I I made those right moves protecting my wealth with assets I could control with cash flow, low debt, um, and not leaving it to the whims of what happens to corporations and and the globe. So um, another topic we can go into deep on another time. We've talked about it a few times, but um, you know you, you do have to be careful because it does impact your retirement and your equity and your home potentially. And those are the two biggest things that most people care about. Absolutely, folks. Again, Anna's got an amazing playlist. I bet you there's a thousand hours of us talking about different topics. Go check it out. Thanks, Anna. Thank you.